All right, it's a great pleasure to introduce our first keynote speaker of the meeting, Dr. Alberto Kornblit. Um, Alberto is currently a professor emeritus of the University of Buenos Aires and also holds the title of Senior Investigator, which sounds actually a lot more impressive when you say it in Spanish. Investigador Superior, I'll try my best. But, um, by the National Research Council of Argentina. And Alberto, we all know in this community, has been a leading light and uh, he's also been a co-organizer of this meeting over the last three installments, so many of us know him well. But for some of the new trainees, I thought I would distill some of his achievements. So Alberto received his training in Argentina, uh, where he graduated with a degree in biology in 1977 from the University of Buenos Aires, and then received his PhD in 1980 at the Campo Mar Foundation, advised by Dr. Hector Torres. Uh, Torres himself being a trainee of and a lineage descendant of the Argentine Nobel Prize winning biochemist Louis Leloire. And uh, after successfully completing his PhD in 1981, he then moved to the University of Oxford and worked with Francisco Tito Barale at the Sir William Dunn School of Pathology. And while he was at Oxford, uh, Alberto made an important uh, discovery and advance in the field by cloning the human fibronectin gene and discovered at that time that it encoded multiple tissue biased protein isoforms. Um, through alternative splicing. And this was contributing at the time to mounting evidence that was emerging of the prevalence of alternative splicing uh, in eukaryotes at this time. Remember that splicing had only been reported by the labs of Phil Sharp and Rich Roberts in uh, 1977 in viral transcripts. So this was a pretty important uh, discovery as people were cloning cDNAs. Um, after cloning fibronectin, Alberto then returned to Argentina back to his homeland and uh, started his position again at the University of Buenos Aires in 1984, where he began as a faculty member and he's remained there since. In his own lab, he continued to use the fibronectin uh, locus as a great model to study both alternative splicing and transcriptional regulation. And it must have been through the use and creation of many reagents studying both of these processes as separate entities that a watershed moment must have occurred sometime in the mid 90s when Alberto and his research team uh, asked an important question, basically could transcription and splicing in fact be coordinated? At the time, both of these layers were thought to work independently, largely based on in vitro assays. And so pursuing this question, his lab uh, led, uh, created a, an elegant series of experiments using splicing reporters, where what they were able to do was swap in and out promoters of different strengths and actually demonstrate that by altering the strength of the promoter to drive uh, expression of these reporters, alternative splicing patterns could indeed be uh, altered. And so these results really provided you know, the first compelling evidence of coupling between transcription and splicing, and has really led to an explosion of research and, and a very active area of research in our, in our community now. Um, and Alberto has really been a leader uh, throughout this, this process and has helped explain some of the mechanisms uh, governing this coupling. And results that, sub that were subsequent involved uh, identifying protein, protein interactions between splicing factors, known as SR proteins, which we know, um, and the large subunit of uh, RNA polymerase II, in particular the CTD, um, that can help promote uh, splice site utilization. Also the finding that the elongation speed of the polymerase itself can uh, impact splicing regulation and decisions. And finally, also this connection between uh, chromatin structure and histone modifications that can influence splicing. Um, importantly, all of this work uh, also has been shown by Alberto's lab to have a, a good physiological relevance in several paradigms, uh, including neuronal differentiation, UV light-induced DNA damage control of dynamic gene expression changes, and also uh, light and dark signaling dynamics in plants. Perhaps fittingly, after a career studying the connections between different layers of gene expression, Alberto's most recent work in collaboration with the lab of Adrian Craner has also exposed how the interplay between chromatin state, transcription elongation, and alternative splicing is likely to make an impact in how we think about the design and use of antisense oligonucleotides. For sustained research excellence, Alberto has received many international and national honors I will only name a few here because there are too many to list. He was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship in 1991. He's been an HHMI International Scholar from 2002 to 2017, 
and was elected international member of the National Academy of Sciences in 2011 and is an associate member of the European Molecular Biology Organization since 2012. In Argentina, he has received the Investigator of the Nation Prize, which is awarded by the President of Argentina in 2010. Following that achievement, um, in 2012, Alberto was actually awarded the Conex Diamond Prize, recognizing the top Argentine scientist of the decade, which he shared with the physicist Juan Martin Maldacena. There are other awards, but I think I'll rest on scientist of the decade in Argentina. <laughs> And I'll end this introduction by uh, discussing another branch of Alberto's achievements that maybe more people don't focus on, and this relates to his role as a mentor and an educator. In his lab, Alberto has directed 20 doctoral thesis students, several of whom are themselves accomplished researchers and remain in our RNA community. Alberto has also taught for many years what I believe is a now famous introductory molecular biology course for hundreds of students each year at the University of Buenos Aires. And I've heard firsthand testimonials at bars from Argentine expats saying that Alberto Kornblit has changed their lives and inspired them through his lectures uh, in that first year biology course. And so in addition to being a great researcher, he's inspiring the next generation of biologists in his country. So without further delay, I'll let Alberto come and give his talk. Thank you, Alberto. <laughs> Uh, hello. <laughs> uh, I didn't expect this introduction, <laughs> actually. Um, I'm very happy to be here. I, I'd like to thank uh, Tracy, Yongshen, and Javier. This is the greatest honor uh, to give an opening lecture in this meeting that has been our meeting, the colleagues I see here, our fellows and colleagues for many, many, many years. So this is really moving. I hope to, to be... <laughs> Uh, well, okay, so there wasn't a title, it's Chromatin Control of Alternative Splicing Towards a Combined Treatment of Spinal Muscular Atrophy, and let me see if, uh, splicing is mostly transcriptional, there are many, many papers indicating this, but I just mentioned three, uh, one, the very old paper of Bayer and Osham, uh, a paper by Hagen Tigner, and, and all the contribution of Carla's lab. But uh, as you know, co-transcriptionality doesn't necessarily mean coupling. And, and this is a, a cartoon I took from Jim Manley's uh, Jim Manley review, because when we talk about coupling, we talk about the influence of uh, the transcription dynamics of machinery on the splicing reaction, and vice versa, the influence of the splicing reaction on the transcription machinery. So uh, the modes of coupling could be two non-exclusive, uh, mechanisms, either changes in pole to elongation rate, which we call uh, kinetic coupling, or changes in the recruitment of processing factors to the RNA polymerase II itself, to the carboxytaminal domain, or to the chromatin donation of RNA that we call recruitment coupling. But you see the and and or, and or means that, sorry. Uh, so I need, I need the pointer, it's different. Uh, the and or means that these two mechanisms are not really exclusive. So I will concentrate on the um, kinetic coupling and my talk will first uh, deal with the role of transcription elongation on alternative splicing, then uh, just a summary of the effects of on chromatin structure on alternative splicing, and finally uh, publish and unpublished results on how we conceived a possible um, combined therapy for spinal muscular atrophy. So uh, when we uh, started to um, test the role of elongation, we found essentially, because we were using the fibronectin exon 33, that slow elongation could cause higher exon inclusion. And the model we were trying to interpret our results is the first come first serve, in which if we have a, uh, an alternative exon which uh, has a weak 3 prime splice site, uh, if uh, pole 2 goes normal or fast, then the stronger site is presented simultaneously to the um, splicing factors, and then uh, it will outcompete the weaker site and lead to skipping. But if transcription was lower, then uh, the weak site will recruit 
splice, positive splicing factor before the stronger side is made, and this would lead to exon inclusion. And we show, Manuel de la Mata showed in an RRI paper in 2010, that this is nothing to do with the order of intron removal, because in the case we were studying, the second intron was spliced first, and the first intron was spliced second. And, of course, there is a lot of contribution from, from David's lab, from David Bentley, and lately uh, confirming that this is not only recruitment, but also a secondary structure of the RNA that is being made that uh, could explain uh, the um, effects of a slow polymerase or, or a fast polymerase. But at that time, we were using only uh, slow elongation. So uh, the conclusion at that time was the slow elongation could cause higher exon inclusion, but after many labs did genome-wide studies, we found out that actually 50 to 80 percent of the elongation-sensitive alternative splicing events uh, responded to this model, and actually, I think that David mentioned this as a class one or type one exons. But there are other exons in which slow elongation causes higher exon skipping, and uh, in that case, also genome-wide studies tell us that um, 20 to 50 percent of elongation sensitive alternative splicing events belong to this, to this uh, model of the class 2 or type 2 exons. And actually, in my lab, uh, Gwendal Dujardin studied one of the mechanisms that explains why, in a particular exon, slow elongation can cause uh, skipping. And this is the case of uh, the CFTR exon 19. And in that case, we have an uh, alternative splicing alternative splice, uh, exon with stronger sites, but then if transcription goes normal, a negative factor, ETR3, cannot bind or binds less efficiently to the target site, and that would lead to inclusion. But if transcription goes low, then the negative factor competes with the, with the positive factors. It's more time to bind uh, to the target site, and that will lead to skipping. So it's important to... to, to Remember these class two exons because this is the case of the exon we are going to modulate in spinal muscular atrophy. So the role of POL2 elongation was confirmed by the use of a slow mutant variable polymerase. I cannot, I don't have time to tell you, but this is just suggestion of David. I will make it short. I went to give a seminar to his lab, and he, when I showed the preliminary data, he said, uh, well, what you need is a slow mutant variable polymerase, so I make it for you. So <laughs> to make the story short, he made the human version of the Drosophila uh, mutant, and that's what we used in Argentina. Uh, and the fact is, this mutant is just a single amino acid change, arginine for histidine in position 349, and then uh, we used uh, a trick of transfecting cells with a reported mini gene for alternative splicing, and together with plasmid expressing either the wild time or the slow mutant, but both of them with a mutation that makes it resistant to alpha manitin. So we would treat cells with alpha manitin. The endogenous POL2 is inhibited and degraded, and the minigen reporter and the endogenous genes are only transcribed by the either slow or wild type POL2. So to make a long story short, this is two examples of class 1 and class 2 exons with a slow POL2. You can see by RT-PCR here that we have uh, upregulation in the case of the fibronectin X23 and downregulation in the case of the CFTR exon 9 um, uh, transcribed by the slow polymerase. So lately, uh, Magda, who is here, where are you, Magda? <laughs> and and uh, Javier um, uh, generated mice with a knock in for the slow polymerase because it, it was important in the animals not to use alpha manitin, but it could, could cause indirect, indirect effects. And actually, uh, these m mice with a slow polymerase are embryonic lethal. And uh, they cultivated the, the, the cells, the embryonic stem cells, and so a lot of changes in gene expression and alternative splicing, but most importantly, there was an inhibition of the uh, uh, neural cell uh, precursors, uh, renewal and, and, and blocking of the differentiation. So that illustrated that um, a slow polymerase that is three to, to four times lower is critical for the normal development of an animal. And also David uh, had shown that in some cases, uh, um, some exons could have exactly the same change in inclusion, either if the uh, transcription was low or transcription was fast. So meaning that there is a very tight uh, control of, of the speed in terms not only of upregulation, downregulation of certain exons, but, but uh, for the correct inclusion 
of an exon, either, you don't want it either slow or, nor fast. And what is it? So, what could change Pol2 elongation rate in a more physiological or pathological uh, situation? Of course, uh, there is no mutant, slow mutant in humans. So it could be either modulation of Pol2 intrinsic activity via CTD phosphorylation or association to elongation factors. And this is something we studied in the UV uh, DNA damage uh, control of alternative splicing, but I'm not going to talk about this. Or changes in the template chromatin structure that could limit or facilitate elongation. So we will focus on these, and also I'm not going to show you all the raw data, but alternative splicing is regulated by chromatin structure by histone marks. And uh, we, just to um, show a cartoon, if you have a compact chromatin uh, with uh, silence and histone marks, then Pol2 goes slower, and that, in the case of class 1 exons, would lead to higher inclusion. But if chromatin is more open, in case of acetylation, for instance, treating the cells with valproic acid, uh, an open chromatin uh, would allow for faster elongation, and in this case would lead to uh, exon skipping. And uh, actually, we have a alternative, common alternative splicing model in the two situations, or the class one or the class two exons. This is for the class two exon. Open chromatin means skipping, and closed chromatin means higher inclusion. But for the, uh, sorry, that was a class one. For the class two, open chromatin means higher inclusion, and uh, closed chromatin means exon skipping. So with all this background, I want to tell you what, uh, we, why we enter in the, in the field of, of SMA, of spinal muscular atrophy. Actually, it was a situation, uh, well, let me just remind you, uh, this is probably, Adrian could come here and tell better than me. Uh, this is a, an autosomal recessive hereditary disease in which motor neurons are defective, and this defect uh, promotes uh, poor innervation and waste uh, skeletal muscle. So, um, and, and you, you remember that this is caused by uh, mutations in the SM1 gene, deletions or disruptive mutations, which uh, abolish the production of the SMM protein. And the SMM protein is everywhere. It's in all tissues, not only in, in, uh, in uh, motor neurons. But for some reason, motor neurons are more sensitive to the reduction in SMM protein. But the fact is, in humans, uh, there is a second gene, SMM2, in the same chromosome, the same length, with just about 11 or, or around 11 uh, base pair differences between SMN2 and SMN1. And the fact is that this gene makes very little SMN protein because it has a key mutation in exon 7. Uh, and so what uh, Adrian did is to de design an, an antisense oligonucleotide that would displace this inhibitory factor, HNMPA1 and A2. And that uh, uh, ASO, that uh, antisense oligonucleotide, it's called nusinersen, or the commercial name is Spinraza. And what you see is that what nusinersen does is to displace HNMPA1 and A2 and promote higher levels of the healthy protein, of the SMM protein. So usually in a long talk, I show one of the movies of the, of the patients that were treated in the clinical trials with, with nusinersen that are very moving. But I just show uh, a cartoon or one, one single picture in which you see that in the case of Cameron, without treatment, uh, he had SMA type 1, uh, would have died in 6 to 10 months or survived prostrated for life with mechanical ventilation. But then after three years of continued treatment with spin rasa, uh, the, the, the boy was riding a tricycle. So uh, this is really an alien achievement and, and is, uh, is absolutely... Uh, incredible. I mean, it's, it's, it's one of the very good cases of basic science uh, promoting uh, the, the medicine and, and, and cure a neurodegenerative disease. So, uh, when this was known, just before 2016, in which uh, Lucy Nelson was approved by the FDA, the Argentinian families came to my lab and said, Alberto, we want you to work in uh, splicing with SMA. And I said, I have nothing to offer. I, I work in, in, in basic science. I don't, I don't really, uh, I, I, I don't want to promise you anything because we, we do nothing related to this exon. But then uh, we wonder if uh, SMN2 exon 7 alternative splicing was controlled by pull 2 elongation. 
And then we did a key experiment using the slow polymerase, and you can see that in this case, this is a mini gene, but we, we saw it uh, also in the endogenous gene, uh, the slow polymerase promoted lower exon inclusion, promoted skipping. So this is a class two exon. And uh, in parallel, we, we got in touch with David Bentley, and uh, he was so kind to go to the databases of the genome-wide studies he had done with the slow and with the fast polymerase, and you can see that uh, revisiting those data that had been published, in the case of the exon 7 inclusion, exon 7 of SMN2, uh, there is an upregulation of inclusion with the fast polymerase and a downregulation of inclusion with the slow polymerase. So everything was uh, in agreement with our use of the slow polymerase in, in minigen systems. So, uh, when we got this result, I phoned the families and I said, okay, we can do something. We can try to work on the system because we have a preliminary result that sounds, sounds interesting. So uh, we uh, figure out that chromatin opening should increase SMN2 exon 7 inclusion by promoting intragenic pole 2 elongation. So we decided to use histone diacetylase inhibitors like tricostatin A, TSA, or valproic acid, DPA, that by promoting histone acetylation will open the chromatin and see what, whether there was a cooperation with the effects of the ASO1 on osinersen. So just uh, to show you most of the results I'm going to show you are not exactly uh, used with nosinersen, but with a ASO1 that contains two more bases, but uh, Adrian and we have proved that in the lab. Uh, Pepe Stigliano is there, have proved it, and uh, that it had exactly the same uh, the same power and the same uh, action as nucinersen. So in, in Hector 93 cells, when you treat them with the ASO1, with nucinersen, you have an increase in exon inclusion. Valproic acid also increases exon inclusion, but I just warn you that this is in the cells. It doesn't seem to be the same in the mice that I'm going to show in a minute. And both together have a cooperative effect, so there is more inclusion when we treated, we treated the cells with the uh, nucinerse and ASO and BPA. And we, we show these with different uh, drugs. Uh, like, as I mentioned, the same results were obtained with TSA and with Saha, and the same results were obtained not only in K293 cells, but in, in uh, uh, patient fibroblasts, which is something that usually they ask you to prove that it's not a problem with a particular cell line, but it works in the actual uh, cells of the patients. So very quickly, I would say one year after we uh, had all the controls that I'm not, I'm not going to show you, uh, I uh, told Luciano Marasco, the graduate student, uh, to come here to Cold Spring Harbor uh, and, 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 and work with Adrian uh, to inject mice. So we wanted to see whether what we saw in cells in culture could be also be seen in mice. And actually, uh, you know, we use the Taiwan strain, and this, this mouse uh, reproduces a severe model of, of SMA, and uh, in the mouse, there is only one gene for the SMN protein. There is no SMN1 and SMN2, just one SMN gene. So if the two alleles are, are mutated, that is embryonic lethal. So that would happen in humans if we had only one gene. So we see the disease because there is, there is a, a paralog. Otherwise, we wouldn't see uh, the disease. Uh, so these uh, Taiwanese researchers had uh, done a transgenic with a human SMN2 transgene, which, of course, it produces little amount of SMN protein, but enough for the mice to be born and if they are not treated, they die in seven days, okay? So anything you do to these pups, if it improves life, lifetime, it means that it's improving the inclusion of the, well, it's improving the disease, I mean, I mean curing the disease. So we did single subcutaneous injections of the nucinersen like ASO1 uh, and or with the HDAC inhibitor. As I mentioned, we use both in one set of experiments, VPA, and another set of experiments, TSA. And uh, this was at day one or two after birth, and we did nothing afterwards. So it doesn't mean that we, we were not trying to uh, design a protocol of treatment. We were just trying to see well, as a proof of principle if just by injection at day one there were some results. And there were some results, 
you can see here at uh, day 11, so they haven't died. This is a wild type heterozygous, and these are the ones that were treated only with ASO1, okay? So they are, they survive, but they are smaller. And this is when they were treated with ESO1 and TSA, they survive and they are bigger. They are just the same size as the heterozygous or wild type. And now 40 days, 42 days old, uh, uh, you see the size difference. This is uh, uh, treated with both reagents and this is only treated with suboptimal doses of the ESO1. So it seemed to be a, a, an improvement of the um, performance of the nucinerus and oligo. So, when we did the um, body weight uh, gain, you can see that VPA alone did nothing. When VPA alone, the mice died at seven days. And uh, then uh, with uh, ASO1 alone, uh, they survive and, and, and gain weight, uh, less than the heterozygous. But then with the two drugs together, uh, there was an improvement in, in the weight gain. And more impressive is with the survival probability with the kaplan mayer uh, plot, in which you can see that BPA alone does nothing. The ASO1, well, at the dose we were using, they are all dead after 60 days. But with uh, ASO1 and BPA, you can see that they survive longer. And this is the p-value that was asked by the reviewer. So I, I, I always tell my students that if you see this, you don't need you don't need a p-value. <laughs> but well, anyway, when you have a reviewer, you have to comply. <laughs> Okay, so uh, the same happened, uh, that was VPA, I think, the, with TSA, the same curves. But this is very important. These are the Western blots of the SMM protein in different organs, okay? So uh, you can see that there is a confirmation that the, the chromatin opener, the, the uh, um, histone deacetylase inhibitor, doesn't increase the amount of the SMM protein in liver, very little in kidney, nothing in muscle, uh, nothing in spinal cord, uh, very little in brain, and nothing in heart. But the two together, the two together really show a difference in the amount of protein that would explain the, the, the size and the, the weight gain, because this is not just using the uh, histone acetylase inhibitor, but how the histone acetylase inhibitor helps uh, nucinerism to work better. So, um, we did neuromuscular function tests, and uh, I remember Luciano sent me by WhatsApp this, uh, this GIFs, and you can see here that with uh, nucinerism alone, uh, this pup takes longer in, in right itself, but with nucinerism and BPA, it uh, writes itself immediately, and you can see here the quantification of this uh, neurological test. And the other test is the grip strength, and this is P7, and this is just, uh, a rough uh, plastic board and seeing how, how much the pup can climb and at what angle it, it, it falls. I always tell that uh, as a Spanish-speaking people, I didn't know how you uh, named that thing that is called a protractor, so I learned English with this experiment. <laughs> we don't call it protractor. <laughs> okay, so this is more complicated because we found that the ASO had chromatin effects, it has some effect on the chromatin. And what is the effect? We found the ASO1, the nucinersin, creates higher K9 methylation. K9 methylation is a silencing mark and a roadblock to pull 2 elongation. So these are the uh, chips uh, of K9 methylation. And you can see the blue line is the increase in K9 methylation by ASO1, and this is abolished by VPA. VPA alone does nothing, and the control is here. And look at this roadblock to elongation that is just uh, upstream of the target site of ASO1. This is the blue line, and this roadblock is abolished by VPA, and it doesn't exist in the control, and doesn't exist in the VPA alone uh, condition. So, this is uh, surprising because this is the contrary effect. We show that slow elongation promote exon skipping. So it means that the ASO could promote both exon skipping and exon inclusion by two different mechanisms uh, that could act together. So 
uh, the model is that ASO1 could not only displace HNMPA1 and A2, but also create K9 methylation, which has the opposite effect. And when we treat the cells of the mice with a histone diacetylase inhibitor, by opening the chromatin, we counteract this negative effect, and then we have a better inclusion of the exon and a better outcome of the mouse. So one proof of this model is looking for a second ASO to uncouple the chromatin and HNMP uh, competition effects. So this is the target site for SPINRASA, for Nusinersen or ESO1, and we uh, chose another sequence in intron 7 uh, and uh, used an oligon ASO that targeted this sequence. So this sequence may have the chromatin effect, but not the uh, displacement of HNMP1 and A2. And this is what we saw, the chromatin effect by the ASO2 is conspicuous for K9 methylation and, and uh, in this case, phosphorine 2 uh, roadblock to elongation, but any isoform of, of, uh, of POL2 uh, has the same pattern. And then, as expected, if only the chromatin effect was performed by ASO2, while ASO1 would increase exon inclusion, ASO2 decreased exon inclusion, inhibited exon inclusion because, because it's only the chromatin effect. So what are the global effects of BPA on transcription? I will just tell you this is point sec or point sec uh, that measures pol 2 densities genome-wide. And this is a metagene analysis in which you see that clearly BPA reduces the signal in the promoter against the gene body. Of course, the ASO1, nosinersen, does nothing, but it's only acting on a single, on a single gene. And uh, just... I show you that this is not an incre the increase in elongation that is not always uh, accompanied by a de an increase in ex gene expression. Uh, here is one gene in which uh, uh, there is no change in gene expression, there is a change in elongation. This is some gene in which there is a change in elongation and a reduction in gene expression. And in the case of uh, SMN2, SMN2, SMN1 merge, because they are, it's impossible to distinguish them. Uh, you see that there is a change in elongation, but a decrease in expression. It's not an, an increase in expression. So how pleiotropic is BPA? Well, uh, there are many changes to our inclusion, and ex uh, so to our overexpression and, and, and uh, inhibition of expression, but actually uh, only a few cases uh, are statistically significant. So it's about 79, 69 differential expressed genes, ASO does nothing, and ASO plus VPA, we see exactly the same number, about 100 cases of change in expression by VPA. Of course, one can say even if there are not many genes uh, affected, it's sufficient that one or two are affected in a negative way, and that, that would be uh, critical. Uh, the same with splicing, uh, very little change. There is a lot of changes in splicing, but very, li very few of them are statistically significant as uh, considered by the people who does this uh, genome-wide analysis. So anyway, and just in case, we wonder with, can, if we can target K9 uh, acetylation just to the SMN2 gene. And so from now on, this is unpublished data uh, performed mainly by Jose Stigliano, who is there. And uh, we decided to use the strategy of the dead Cas9, which is, is a Cas9 that it has no catalytic activity, doesn't cut DNA. Uh, but we used a Cas9 that was fused to a transcription activator called VP64. And so with two different plasmids, one expressing the specific RNA guide and one, the other one is expressing the uh, fusion protein DCAS9 VP64, we were aiming at targeting uh, this uh, transcription activator that is known to recruit the uh, acetyl transferase P300. So to create a local uh, opening of the chromatin, a local acetylation. So uh, Jose, we call him Pepe, uh, designed different guides, uh, the promoter, uh, intron uh, 6, uh, intron 7. This is a target site of ASO1. This is exon 7. But I will just focus on, on results we can confirm now on the B guide that uh, binds or targets intron 6. And you can see what one of the controls is to demonstrate that actually the, the actual protein, the Cas9, is recruited to the place we want to, 
to, to send it. And you can see here the difference between these two bars is one is with a non-targeting guide and the other one is the targeting B guide. And you can see this is a chip for Cas9 that is actually recruited to the site we wanted to recruit it. And there is no recruitment of color at the promoter or at entrance 7. The second control is to see what happens with histone acetylation. And you can see that uh, again, this is with a, a non-targeting guide and with a targeting guide. We observe an increase in histone acetylation around the area of the uh, um, B uh, guide target site, but also downstream. So there is acetylation downstream. Okay. And what happened with the methylation that we were uh, dis we discovered that the ASO promoted methylation? But you can see uh, this is a complex slide. But let me tell you that. When you t target the dead Cas9 with BP64 that recruits pre 300 to the, to the B uh, region, uh, you see that together with ASO1, it has an effect. ASO1 alone promotes K9 methylation, this is a chip, but then when we target the acetyl transferase or the um, activator that recruits acetyl transferase, there is a reduction, as we saw when we treat it with VPA. So there is a higher methylation that with VPA went down. Here, a higher methylation that with the with, um, high methylation caused by the ASO that with the targeted acetylation went down. So if, if this is true, there should be a cooperation in alternative splicing. And this is uh, one of the last slides showing that we, we did the RT-PCR for uh, inclusion of Exxon 7. Uh, this is uh, the control guide RNA, the non-targeting. This is uh, the intron, uh, the side B, intron 6 guide RNA. This is the effect of the ASO, and this is the effect of the ASO plus targeting the acetylation directly to the um, SMN2 gene. So essentially, uh, more details about this could be seen on Jose Stiliano's poster, number 238. And I'm uh, finishing with conclusions, and there is some bonus track. Uh, so we know that kinetic coupling means that slow elongation can promote either exon inclusion or skipping, depending on the particular alternate splicing event we are looking at. And we also know that changes in intragenic chromatin structure caused by changes in histone marks can alter alternative splicing decisions. And we were proposing and are proposing a combined therapy for spinal, spinal muscular atrophy, atrophy in which uh, nucinersen could be combined with chromatin opening strategies, either using a general drug like valproic acid or perhaps in the future targeting acetylation specifically to the gene. Uh, so, but we found a new mechanism in which the ASO has two opposite effects. The negative effect is counteracted by opening the chromatin with histone acetylase inhibitors, and um, uh, we can now target histone acetylation, as I mentioned, to the SMN2 uh, alternative splicing region to help nucinersen. So, this was the cover of cell, and you can see here this is a Calder, uh, Alexander Calder uh, mobile. Uh, per, created by Luciana Jono, and you can see that if uh, the white plate is exon 7, when you have acetylation, there is inclusion of the white plate. On the contrary, when you have methylation, there is skipping of the white plate. Okay. So um, this is Luciano Marasco, this is Jose Stiliano. I recommend it to see his poster. And Adrian, of course, some collaboration from Nick Proudfoot and from Ruiz Sosa Luis and Wendell Dujardin. But just let me tell you that in my lab we also studied um, coupling in plants. And uh, just to make a very, very long story short, Guillermina Kubaska, who is in the audience, and Mikaina Hertz, uh, uh, together with a former uh, postdoc, uh, Ezekiel Petrillo, they found that in plants, um, Light controls alternative splicing decisions through the chloroplast by um, controlling pole 2 elongation. We found that actually uh, in dark, in the, in the night, uh, pole 2 goes slower. And in the daylight, it goes faster. 
Um, but the poster of Guillermina now is applying this model, this paradigm, to ju just not to alternative splicing, but to cleavage and polymerization, and we have effects of light in alternative cleavage and polymerization. So uh, I have the funding for many years from HHMI, now QSMA, FAME, and, 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 and the Lounsbury Foundation. Uh, this, I will not tell you the story of my life, but these are all the collaborations I had in my uh, more than 35 years of, of research, and also all the uh, people who were working. Uh, incidentally, Anna Fishman is in the audience and she's studying genome-wide effects of promoters on alternative plasma, and recovering a very, a very uh, old result of my lab at the time we didn't have genome-wide. Where are you, Anna? Okay, hello. So, uh, if you give me two minutes, I want to explain mainly the young generations why I got involved in coupling, okay? Why? Why? John said something, but actually, so the fact is, when I was in Tito Barales' lab, we cloned human fibronectin, and we immediately found that inclusion of this exon that we call extra domain one uh, was observed in many cells except for liver. And what is this? This is not the northern lot. This is an S1 mapping. People don't know what S1 mapping is. It's a Berg chart. So, just look in the Wikipedia what S1 mapping was, <laughs> okay? So there was a strict, strict uh, cell type dependence, and liver is the source of plasma fibronectin that, that is in, 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 in the plasma as a globular protein, and the other cells are the source of extracellular matrix fibronectin that are fibers. So, okay, there was a specificity that we didn't understand why. But then when I went on to Buenos Aires, we studied the promoter of the fibronectin gene and found that there were two enhancers, the CRE and the CAT, and again, there was tissue specificity. So in liver, we had occupation of both enhancers. These are footprintings, probably yours. This is more modern than, than S1 mapping, but not that modern, okay? <laughs> <laughs> uh, but in other cells, like, or in other tissues, like brain, only the CRE was occupied. So with this in mind, <laughs> I told one graduate student, Paula Kramer, that David knows very well, uh, okay, I have this, this mad idea, why don't you swap promoters to see whether there is a coupling between transcription and alternate splicing? And I told her, if there is an effect, you will have a thesis and a paper, and if there is no effect, you will have a thesis, but not a paper. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so we changed the promoters, and we had an effect. Look at this. Alpha globin promoter, no inclusion. Fibronectin promoter, a lot of inclusion. CMB promoter, almost the same. So we did all a series of experiments, and many of them were just deleting an enhancer or targeting, this is with the help of David Bentley, uh, transcription factors to the promoter, to the enhancer, to the promoter that would promote elongation. You can, uh, and that time we didn't use the slow polymerase, but it was clear that it was something was happening with elongation and how the promoter was occupied. And, and then simultaneously in 1997, and this is the last slide, uh, David and Susan McCracken published a seminal paper in which they showed that if they remove the CTD from RNA polymerase two. There was transcription, but there wasn't capping, nor splicing, nor cleavage and polymerization. I think this is one of the beginnings of our friendship, okay? <laughs> okay. Thank you. And I have it. So the, the, the light is red, but I think the bonus track was worth it. So I think we still have maybe a few minutes for, for questions. We'll take some questions from the audience. Carla. This is preliminary. We have we have we had good results with with the B guide, but also we have decided to do a pull-up guides, 
And with the pool of guides, we also have a good result, but we haven't yet figured out which of the guides of the pool are important. Okay, and those guides are more downstream. What do you expect? I, I don't know. What I expect is if I target the promoter and I open the chromatin of the promoter and I get more transcription, I shouldn't see an effect as strong as the one intragenic. That's my expectation. We actually, we have some hints on this. And this is important because BPA was used uh, in clinical trials for uh, SMA. And it was used in the assumption that if you increase transcription of SMN2, you will get more protein, SMN, even though it's, uh, the splicing is uh, defective. But very preliminary results indicate if we, we get more transcription from the beginning, we don't see an effect so far, 30 kb away. So I, I don't know which are the critical regions, but our promoter control is important. David has a question. Yeah. Um, Alberto, I, I wondered whether you know whether the um, ASO is affecting. Uh, do you know whether the ASO is affecting K9 methylation through its interaction with RNA or DNA? And is it known whether the chemical modification of the ASO influences the chromatin effect? The second, the second answer is I don't know. And the first, I don't know either, but I, 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 have, I have conflictive results. We were thinking, because we published a, a paper in 2009, in which we showed that siRNAs targeting introns by base pairing with an intron sequence and needing AGO1 would promote K9 methylation and K27 methylation and create blood block through elongation. This was Mariano Alio's paper. But in fact, we are not sure that the mechanism in the case of our ASO is the same. First, because we knock down AGO1, there is no change in the effect. And uh, second, because I think that, uh, Adrian, could you uh, tell me if the I mean, there are preliminary results that maybe other drugs that affect splicing also create K9 methylation. Yeah, Eric has a poster. Yeah, the yeah Eric, Eric has a poster in which it may, might not be this mechanism that was the one that inspired us to try. So I don't know. We can compare now siRNAs and ASOs. siRNAs are different guys. They are not modified, they are RNAs. But no, I don't have the answer to your question. So I know, or I guess, that our loops are not involved because in the paper we overexpress RNAs H and there is no effect on the K9 methylation or the splicing. Maybe one more question. Hi. I have a very related question. I um, don't see you. Right. Ah. Hi. Um, I was wondering about the Argo now. So did you look at the ASOs? come down in Argo pulldowns, maybe not Argo 1, but the other Argo <laughs> You mean a biotelinated ASO? You could, yeah. Mm -hmm. We are in the process. <laughs> okay. Okay, let's thank Alberto again for a very Thank you. Time.